Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. I've been sitting on this topic for a while, mostly because of the drastic changes over the last few weeks and over the last few months. If you're listening to this in the future, I'm coming to you from the pandemic times of early 2020 and COVID-19. Social distancing, quarantine, lockdown, rioting in the streets, social unrest, civil unrest, literally across the country and across the world. So... This topic arose from a question asked by a user on Mastodon, and at the time, it was particularly timely because it was about travel and working offline and stuff like that. I'd just gotten back from a work trip because that was something you could still do back in February of 2020. Now, well, things are different. I'm really not supposed to go anywhere. Work trips are kind of out, and vacations have turned into staycations. But it could be worse, and as things go, I do occasionally have to work offline because of a random storm, or there's an internet outage, or you know, whatever. Back in the before times, I would usually be offline because I'm on a plane or something, and honestly, the in-flight Wi-Fi is woefully inadequate for anything I'd be interested in doing. So, conditions like that in mind, let's push forward anyway, and we can talk about working offline, and how to best do it and how to plan for it. It doesn't matter so much how you got offline, though I hope a choice was made there. So be it travel or thunderstorms or whatever, you know, I, like I said, I hope you had a choice to make there and it just did not. Oops, lights are out. So our friend on Mastodon said, I'm curious if you've ever researched ways to go offline. With a bad connection, I found it necessary to use apps that can cache content down so I can read them offline but I'm always looking for better ways to do this. Plex is your friend. Still looking for good news readers, not sure what to do for Netflix, etc. Was just curious. So, given everything going on, maybe it is time to settle back and unplug for a bit. Maybe you need the break from the online frenzy, or you're in a situation where the connectivity is questionable. Maybe you're heading out to a cabin in the woods for a graycation or a hurley day. Or, you know, maybe you're sitting back at your regular desk and Twitter just won't shut up. Turn off, tune in, and hang out. Living the online life isn't too bad, really. And hopefully, it's just a temporary state of affairs. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 59, Situation Offline. My name is Daniel Messer, and I'm welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersections of libraries and technology, and is all about living the high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hello, hello, beloved, hola, hello, konnichiwa, bonjour, and how the hell are you? Cyberpunk Librarian is back on the air, streaming into your ear holes and taking up space on your smartphone. And this time around... We've got a show that's all about going offline and getting things done and keeping yourself entertained, embracing the world beyond the cloud. But hey, uh, before I get started, I've got some follow-up for you, copyright John Syracusa. Back in episode 58, you'll notice that I was uh, pretty big on the PubliStatic uh, blogging platform, and the only real complaint I had about it was the lack of a spell check. Well... Looks like that feature was coming in version 0.36, and as I write this, 0.36 is out, and it is gorgeous. Oh my God, beloved, you should you should really see this. It's um, it, it's it's different. Th- it's different in a in a good way. I mean, you can. It's not like they totally redesigned the UI or. Oh my God, everything's different. It's just that you can tell. Oh, they spent some time. They said they had some thoughts. They put those thoughts into action and they upgraded this in a marvelous way. 
They've got a new block editor that's kind of all the rage right now. WordPress uses it, Medium uses it, all that stuff. And it's fine. I, I don't care. I really, I really don't care about the block editing so long as I can type text and add pictures and it's not too big of a pain in the ass, you know? So yeah, if, if you're into the Publi thing and you haven't updated to 0 0.36, do so. Because not only is it really cool looking, but it comes with a spell check. So I can actually do my writing right there in the app. I don't have to do this copy-paste and move things around, which is, it's not a huge problem, but it's another step that you have to do. And anything that kind of reduces that work, that's that's pretty cool. So there are a few other interesting that thing in, things in that release, too. I will leave a link in the show notes if you're interested, and you can kind of check that out. So, okay, great. Now that that's out of the way, let's dive into the rest of the show. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. You might be 30,000 feet above the ground. You might be deep in a forest. You might be within the concrete canyon of a major city. You look down at your phone. You'll check out the indicator on your laptop or tablet. And that's when you notice you're disconnected. And you know what? That's okay. That's fine. As a guy who literally lives at the edge of a forest, I recommend that people regularly disconnect from the net, and stick their head outside to see what's going on. But for some, there's a feeling of dread that arrives when they realize that without an internet connection, their phone is a beautiful glass brick. Their laptops and tablets have suddenly turned into lunch trays. I can't get on Reddit? No Twitter? No Mastodon? What will I do? Well, as George Carlin once said, calm down, have some dip. You can do quite a lot really. But before we get into the how to be happy and productive in an offline world, occupying a digital outback, sort of speak, let's, let's do a little planning ahead. See, if you've done some prep work in advance, you'll always be ready to work and live offline for a while. Friends, I have driven across the United States several times, and when you're rolling Interstate 40, or better yet, Interstate 20, You'll check your phone and you think, hey, I've got three bars of LTE. That's great. Huh. Lies. All lies. Th th those three bars, three lies. Just because your phone tells you you've got full bars doesn't mean you've got full connectivity. When you're barreling down the stretch of nothing that is the I-20 between Abilene and Fort Worth, Texas, you quickly realize that connectivity is the exception, not the rule. That in mind, first things first, I, I recommend an offline plan that's good to go on multiple fronts. I'm going to run through my sort of standard offline travel setup, because usually when I go offline, it's normally because I'm traveling somewhere. But you could apply these offline strategies to, you know, going camping in the woods, maybe going on a road trip or a beach vacation or so on. It, uh, though, honestly, if you are going camping or road tripping, you really don't need this much stuff. I usually work remote. I take my office with me. So not only do you need to do that most of the time, take it from me, you shouldn't do that. If you're going to disconnect for a vacation, just disconnect. It's worth it. That's what the vacation's for. So travel-wise, I usually pack two bags, a backpack and a rollerboard, you know, little suitcase with the wheels on the bottom of it. And I'm packing for two scenarios, the travel time itself and what happens after I arrive. That means my backpack is usually within reach unless I'm driving and then I only need my, my iPhone. But if I'm on a plane, the backpack is under the seat in front of me. If I'm a passenger in a car or a bus or a train, it's somewhere nearby. If I'm walking, it's on my back. The backpack is specifically there to carry my digital gear. The rollerboard, that's in the overhead or the trunk or whatever. I usually don't do much with it until I get to a hotel or an Airbnb or whatever. The rollerboard is there to carry my clothes, my toiletries, running shoes, and that kind of stuff. But it's also hauling a sling bag, which will become important later on. So if I'm actually traveling somewhere, my typical loadout, tech-wise, Looks like this. I'm usually carrying a MacBook Pro and currently rocking a Retina 15-inch uh, mid-2015 model of MacBook Pro, the one before they took all the ports away. My iPhone, which is currently an iPhone uh, 10s Max, 
my iPad Pro, which is currently the 12.9 inch slab of glass in a foldable case to protect it. Love that iPad Pro, especially since they added the, uh, the cursor functionality and all that. It's really starting to become a laptop replacement for me. I've got the um, Apple Magic Keyboard for the iPad because that's a joy to type on. And I've got the Apple Magic Mouse for the MacBook in my bag. For the iPad, I have a Logitech M535. It's it's a cheaper mouse, but it's also one of those mice where if I lose it, I maybe have only lost 20 bucks. It's it, I, I feel a little bit more comfortable using that with the iPad um, because the iPad I'll be using you know, on the plane at a coffee shop or something. If it falls off the table and smashes, well, boo-hoo, I'm out $20. If the Apple Magic Mouse falls off the table and smashes, I think that thing was like $60, $70. So I, I kind of take a little bit better care of that one. We've got my Apple Pencil. I've got a Kindle Paperwhite, which is also in a protective case because, <laughs> let's face it, I need to protect my gear from me. I've got a Samsung portable 500 gigabyte SSD. I've got various charging cables that looks like a, a, a squid has gone insane. I've got an LED flashlight, a standard wallet, keys, passport, stuff like that. Uh, then I've got the uh, wired Apple earbuds. I like those when I'm running. I have not yet gotten into that whole thing of putting the... Uh, putting the music on my watch and then pairing Bluetooth to it. I just, eh, I just prefer to take the phone with me. Um, Plantronic Backbeat Fit Bluetooth headphones. Now that sounds kind of uh, specific, but it's not. These are just some wireless, you know, Bluetooth headphones that are comfortable, fit over the back of my head, then over my ears, and I can literally wear them all day. And what those are for is they're for taking phone calls, conference calls, uh, listening to podcasts in a library or office environment. The cool thing about these is, you know, like I said, they're wireless. And while I could use them to run, they just don't have quite the same sound as uh, the Apple earbuds. And then finally, the Sennheiser HD 4.50 BTNC, because Sennheiser really knows how to name their products. They're not quite as bad as Sony. As it happens, that BTNC stands for Bluetooth Noise Cancelling. And these are the big over-the-air headphones, you know, the noise-canceling headphones, and I won't get on a plane without them. These things are magic. I love them. So, three sets of headphones. That may sound excessive, but keep in mind that the Sennheisers weigh more than 10 each of the Plantronics or the Apple earbuds. We're not talking a whole lot of added weight here. And since each of the headphones has a specific purpose, that's why I carry the three. I go running with the wired earbuds. The back beats are used for the telephones and conference calls. So sometimes I need to be mobile, moving around in a library while talking to tech support or something. Um, heck, I've been on the phone with IT while I'm crawling around under a desk checking cables. And the back beats, they don't have wires to get in my way. I'm not hanging my Apple earbuds up on something and then strangling myself or whatever. I carry the other two headphones in the same case as the Sennheisers, so we're not talking about a, a whole lot of additional room and weight. Once I get to a longer-term stopping point where I'll establish my base of operations, like a hotel room or something, the sling bag, that comes out, and the iPad goes in along with the Magic Keyboard and Logitech mouse, the Pencil, the Kindle, and the Backbeat headphones. I can do 95% of my work on an iPad, so I will use the MacBook for the more heavy lifting things like coding, presentations, database work, and SQL stuff, uh, creating training materials, virtual machines, stuff like that. Depending on the plans for the day, I will probably leave the MacBook in the hotel room. Almost everything else goes in the sling bag, and that's what I use for getting around wherever it is I wind up. And in that bag, I've got a lot of stuff that will provide entertainment, help me stay productive, and allow me creative outlets. And that will make the time on the road so much better, even when the iPhone says, searching for signal. It just comes down to a little planning and some fantastic apps.
So this one time, I went to a big library conference called Computers and Libraries. It's about computers and libraries. Anyway, on the flight back home, my plane suffered a small problem at the gate. Not sure what it was, but I knew things weren't going well when the pilots and flight attendants walked out of their gate with, uh, with sour looks on their faces. Probably not a good sign. Anyway, this landed me an extra night in Crystal City, Virginia, population boring. I was stuck in a nice hotel for the evening and everything was paid for by the airline because, unlike some of the other asshats around me, I didn't go up and yell at the customer service lady. I was fairly sure she wasn't the cause of the mechanical failure to begin with. So, turns out, when you're nice to people, sometimes you too will be treated well. Especially if the 35 people before you were, as I explained, asshats. I had a lovely room, a meal card, and all I had to do was pay for my drinks. So I ate and drank and slept and hopped on a shuttle to the airport the next morning for a flight out of Reagan National to Boston to Charleston and then finally back home to Phoenix. I learned something during that time and that something is to take full advantage of the Wi-Fi and fill up your devices. Before I get into apps, I want to get into a simple strategy that kept me going through two layovers and three plane rides after an extra night in Crystal City, which is a long plastic hallway filled with melancholy and inexpensive beer. When I went up to my room and hooked up my laptop to the Wi-Fi, I connected to my VPN and I hit up my file server at home. And then I selected about eight hours worth of movies and documentaries and started pulling all of it down to my deck. Yeah, hotel Wi-Fi isn't the fastest thing on Earth, but I sure as heck wasn't going anywhere for the next 10 hours or so. My strategy borrows from one of my favorite authors, Hunter Thompson. These days, before I leave the house, I'll have two iOS devices, 75 hours of music playlists, five ebooks on my Kindle, an iPad half full of movies, and a whole galaxy of mobile games, podcasts, audiobooks, and creative applications, and also a set of wired headphones, noise-canceling headphones, a bag full of charging cables, and two dozen e-magazines. Not that I'll need all of that for the trip, but once you get locked into a serious content collection, the tendency is to push it as far as you can. These days, loading up on content means downloading a bunch of stuff through your favorite streaming apps. So let's kind of hit this category by category. When it comes to movies and TV shows, I personally have subscriptions to Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, CBS All Access, and Amazon Prime. Well, that sounds like a lot. What I don't have is a subscription to cable. Uh, a week or so before the trip, I'll hit up those services and let's see what looks good and download what I can. I love supernatural TV shows with the ghost hunters and the paranormal investigators and all of that. That stuff is just, it's candy, and it's probably like candy to my brain. It's probably rotting my skull, but oh well, I enjoy them. So, I'll pull down episodes of Most Haunted from Prime, along with Ghost Adventures from Hulu. I've been considering a Crunchyroll subscription, too, because I've recently got back into watching anime. But hey, you know what else I'll check? I'll hit up my local library's website because they have Hoopla. And Hoopla offers a ton of movies and television shows, so I'll browse through there and see what piques my interest. And if I find something I like, I'll check that out and download it to my iPad. I've also got a card to another library that offers Canopy, which is a metric ton of indie movies and documentaries and the Great Courses series. Same deal, I will find something that I like, check it out, download it. And hey, I've got a few terabytes of movies, concerts, TV shows, anime, and documentaries myself. Maybe I'll throw some of that on the iPad too. And for that stuff, there's my old buddy VLC. The VLC app for iOS isn't bad at all, and it's like its desktop counterpart. It will play damn near anything you throw at it. AVI, MKV, MP4, MOV, WMV. Wait, WMV? The hell is wrong with you? Obviously, you made some poor life choices. But it's okay. It doesn't matter. VLC will play it on the iPad without a flutter or an issue. When it comes to planning for a period of disconnection... Never underestimate the value of an iPad or an external hard drive full of content. Now then, music. Music is incredibly important to me, and these days, 
Music more or less means Spotify. Yes, there are times when I look at Spotify and wonder if a jury would convict me of beating their app designers. But for 90% of the time, it does what I need, and it does it pretty well. The other 10% of the time mostly involves profanity, where and syncing local files over Wi-Fi. It's... Mm -hmm. There are certain playlists I must have synced to my phone and downloaded before leaving the house, let alone leaving the ground. I'll need my running music, which is about 560 songs and 42 hours of music. No, I don't listen to all of that on a run, but I do have a selection available to me. Then there's the Celtic folk and Quebecois trad folk, because that music just makes me so happy. I'll have several albums by Le Vent du Nord that are not on Spotify, so I'll make sure they're on the device too. That's where the profanity usually comes in. And then finally, there's my ambient and space playlist, because that music literally gets me high. But hey, if you're not rocking a Spotify or Apple Music subscription, check out your local library. If they, if they have a service called Freegal, you can download music and you get to keep what you download. It's high-quality MP3. It's really kind of nice. Uh, each library has their own weekly limits, so even if you do have it, your library might only allow five downloads per week, or some other library might allow eight. I don't know. Um, so, you know, check check to see what's going on. Or if, uh, once again, going back to Hoopla, if your library offers Hoopla, you have access to a huge collection of fantastic music through Hoopla. They've they've got Billie Eilish, which I think you need to kind of have these days to in your collection to legitimize it. But all kidding aside, though, they've got they've got the new albums on the top 40. They've got show tunes and soundtracks, country and contemporary hip hop and alternative. They've got a huge selection. And when you check out music from Hoopla, you get the entire album and you can download it to your device for offline listening. And, you know, there's this thing I like to call therapeutic audio. And these are things like white noise generators or apps that offer sounds to soothe your mind or to relax you. When I'm fighting insomnia, a noise generator app is often helpful to get me back to sleep because, at least for me, it gives my mind only a single thing to focus on. I can focus on that noise or on those sounds, and it just kind of helps slow me down a bit. Now, for myself... I use an app on iOS called Dark Noise, and it's not only beautifully designed, but the audio is superb. You have lots of choices from different kinds of noise. I mean, you can have the white noise, the brown noise, the gray noise, pink noise. Um, for me, funny enough, brown noise and gray noise are the go-to for when my brain just needs to shut the hell up for a while so I can go to sleep. But more than that, Dark Noise offers rainfall thunderstorms, trains, planes, and automobile noises, along with one of my favorites, Starship Engine. It's literally, it's basically just the, uh, the sound of the Star Trek Enterprise, you know, Enterprise D uh, engine. You can find all kinds of apps like this at your local app store, and I highly recommend them. They're great for giving yourself a little separation from the world around you. And while we're on the subject of audio... Let's not forget podcasts. I mean, obviously, you're somewhat interested in podcasts because, after all, here you are. Now, podcasts are seriously my primary form of entertainment outside of music. Actually, I would hate to try and figure out whether I indulge in one over the other more often. I mean, as I was typing this up, uh, space music was pouring into my ears from Soma FM, but before that, I sat down and I was listening to Back to Work with Merlin Mann and Dan Benjamin. So for podcasts, I use Overcast on my iPhone and iPad because I like the developer. I love the software, and it keeps my podcast synced both in what I've downloaded and where I've stopped listening. So I can more or less pick up a podcast on either my iPad or my iPhone, and I'll be within seconds of where I left off. Sometimes it's, it's right there. No matter which device I was using last, it doesn't matter. Overcast, I set it to download all of the new shows in my various feeds. I know some people who stream their podcasts, and hey, that's that's fine, that's cool. Um, but seeing as how I listen to a lot of shows, I want it on my device, and I've never had a problem with listening to a podcast so long as I was able to connect to the net for just a few minutes, gather up all the latest goodies, and from there forward, they live on my device until the episode is over, and then... Overcast automatically deletes that episode. 
And because they're living on my device, it doesn't matter if I've lost my connection. It's, it's local. That's local storage. It doesn't matter if you're disconnected from the internet. You have your shows with you, which is why I always download them. And before we finish with audio, I, I guess I'd be a bad librarian if I didn't mention audiobooks. But you see, the thing about me in audiobooks is I really don't use them. I have nothing against audiobooks, and I've listened to a few that were really good. The biggest problem I have with audiobooks uh, was something I discovered in the summer of 2007 when I noticed Spook Country by William Gibson was available at the library in an audiobook, but we didn't have the paper copy in. Well, I wanted to read that book, damn it, and I figured an audiobook is better than no book. So I checked it out, started listening. And it's great. Seriously, fantastic book. I, I liked Pattern Recognition a little bit better, but I, Spook Country is a damn fine novel. The reader was excellent. Everything was fine until I got my hands on the hardcover. Because I was curious. I wanted to see how far along in the book I was, you know, because it, it's hard to tell. I mean, it, you know, at the time it was audio CDs, so I didn't really understand how far along in the book. I could see how far I was, you know, through the audio CD collection. So I um I checked it out. I just you know I I started flipping through the books like okay no no I've been I've been I've seen this we we've been here oh, oh yes here we are and when I figured out that I was about a third of the way through the book in a week if I had been reading the book myself I had been I would have been done in a week I almost threw the book across the room instead I checked it out returned the audio book and finished the book in a few days and by the way once again go read that good book. But for audiobooks, you, you you have Audible. Everybody knows about Audible. They advertise on every podcast known to man, and that's great because they're supporting podcasts. Totally into that. But Audible costs money, and you may not want to spend that money on audiobooks. So once again, may I refer you to the several audiobook services your library probably offers. Check out your library's website and see if they have anything like Overdrive, RB Digital, or once again, our friend Hoopla. All three of these services allow you to check out and download audiobooks for free so long as you have a library card. And if you're into that thing, yeah, that's great. You can, And the thing is, is if your library, some libraries have multiple services. I, I work for a few libraries that have Overdrive and Hoopla. And they, they really don't count against each other. So if you can only download, say, 10 audiobooks from, uh, from Overdrive and 10 audiobooks from Hoopla... Well, that means you can literally down 20, download 20 audiobooks. So if, if, you're, if you're into that, go for it. It didn't cost you anything. I mean, you already paid for it. That's what your taxes do. Now, I'm not a big news guy. Uh, indeed, I have found that my mental state has greatly improved over the last four years by doing my best to cut the news out of my life as much as possible. I mean, it still finds me, but... You know, I, I try and try and separate myself from, especially mainstream media, where if it leads, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, and everything is the worst. And there, if there is a human interest story about something positive, it's it's one thing amongst a bloodbath. So, I do like the occasional magazine, though, and I certainly do read a lot of news about technology, video games, music, and other topics specific to my interest. So, my desire to read a thing can be a bit manic. And while I can get into a book for hours, sometimes I just want to read a bunch of short articles. And luckily, there are a few ways to go about this. Now, I am a big fan of Read It Later tools, and right now my go-to Read It Later service is Pocket. It's built into Firefox, and Firefox is basically my operating system of choice. For those who might not know, there are several options out there that allow you to send a web link to a service, and it will retrieve the article at that link and then save it for you in a readable in a, in a readable format. And most of them will strip out all the craft and the BS advertising garbage, leaving you with that well-formatted article and usually the images that will accompany it. The idea is, is you'll use an app to pick up those articles later and, you know, read them later. That's why they're called a read it later service. Pocket is great for this, but there's others. There's Instapaper and Wallabag, and I think there's a new one that's out recently for iOS, something, uh, Keep It, I think it's called, or something. I, I took a look at an article about that, and it looks cool, but it looks like it does everything that Pocket does, so I see no reason to switch. So, 
Before I go dark on the net, whether it's for a plane ride or you know, a road trip, a vacation, I will fire up Pocket on my iPhone and my iPad and let it download all of those articles for offline reading. You do have to open the app while you have a network connection and get the stuff. But once you got the stuff, the stuff is on your device. And once again, if it's on your device, it doesn't matter if you have that internet connection. You can just read it now. And once it's on the device, I'm good to go. And if you're into magazines like I am, well, you've got some options there too. Many public libraries offer digital magazines that you can download to your device. Um, check your library's website. Look for names like RB Digital or Flipster. Both of these services bring you fantastic digital magazines, and all you need is a library card. Paid subscription to digital magazines, that those exist too, and you can find those through apps like Zinio. But for my money, which means no money at all in this case, one of the greatest magazine repositories on the net is found at the Internet Archive, baby. See, I grew up during the 80s and 90s, and I got my first computer in 1986-ish. It was a beautiful Commodore 64. And that, that computer is still a special device to me. I, I still think back fondly on my time with the Commodore 64. So, back then, I knew there were gaming magazines and magazines about programming the thing, and all kinds of nerdy stuff like that. But the problem is, is I really didn't have access to them. I accidentally happened on an issue of a magazine called Zap64. That's Z-Z-A-P exclamation point six four. And I literally wore the damn thing out, reading it from cover to cover multiple times. I wanted more, but it was a UK publication and there wasn't a good way for a young kid in Yakima, Washington to get that kind of thing. But you know what? The Internet Archive has a vast treasure trove of Zap64 and other Commodore magazines besides. Oh, and they've got magazines on the ZX Spectrum and Atari computers and Apple and Sinclair. Or you can get classic PC gaming magazines or magazines about the original PlayStation or Genesis Gaming and so much more. It's like Nerdvana, especially if you happen to be an older nerd. I uh, have a bunch of these on my iPad right now. They're just they're just there because I can just pick up my iPad and open one up and just flip through it, looking for a cool article, beautiful pictures. Some of the ads back then they actually cared, so they put some thought into them. They looked really good. I mean, yeah, beautiful, beautiful imagery, and they're not hard to find. Uh, because, you know, like I said, I'm an older nerd, and you can just go to the Internet Archive and get all of them. I'll have some links in the show notes to uh, to some of my favorites, along with the magazine rack collection on the Archive. If you're into this kind of thing, you're going to love it. Because even if you're not into, you know, classic gaming magazines, they've got tons of other magazines besides. You know, check them out. So, okay, finally, for this segment... Uh, Let's uh, keeping yourself entertained while you're offline. I save the best for last. Well, at least it's the best for last when you happen to be a librarian, because I did mention that I tend to read quite a bit, and I already mentioned my Kindle Paperwhite, which is my e-reader of choice, along with my iPad Pro. And all things Kindle flow through Amazon, or do they? See, I'm all about Kindle simply because it's the best e-reader for me. It's the best one I've ever tried. Um, I'm told that there are a couple Kobo e-readers out there that I need to get my hands on, and you know, I'm, I'm more than willing to give those a shot. I am not married to that Kindle. It's just the best I can find for what I want. But Amazon stubbornly refuses to support e-books in the EPUB format, even though there's absolutely no reason they can't. I mean, an EPUB is basically an HTML zip file. So, I'll make the damn Kindles support EPUB through the magic of Calibre, the all-in-one ebook solution for all your ebook needs. If I happen to have an EPUB that I want to read on my Kindle, Calibre converts it to AZW or Mobi format, and with that, the ebook suddenly works on a Kindle. I have somewhere around 10,000 titles in my ebook collection, and many of them are in EPUB format. But thanks to Calibre, I don't have to care. It takes seconds to make the conversion and get a file that will work on my preferred e-ink device. And because it's Calibre and because it does all of the e-book things, 
You can actually have your Kindle plugged into it, and I've noticed here recently, this is probably a feature that's been there for ages, I just didn't use it at the time, where if you try and drag an EPUB file to your Kindle, it'll just do the conversion. It, it understands that EPUB doesn't work on the Kindle, so it just handles that little detail for you. So that that's great. That's one of the hundreds of reasons that I love Caliber. And sure, you can buy ebooks from Amazon, and I do. I mean, that is a thing that I do, and... Goddess knows I have a time or two, but have you ever considered maybe not buying books from Amazon? Because, you know, our old friend over there, the public library, yeah, um, they might have one or more services that allow you to download books for free. So if you if you happen to have a Kindle, the thing you want to look for first is Overdrive or Libby. Libby is the app for the Overdrive service. But some libraries call the service Libby, too, and that makes sense because you need the Libby app to read OverDrive content, and the fact that the name of the service doesn't match the name of the app, well, that's unfortunate. Now, <laughs> there used to be an OverDrive app for the various platforms, and believe me, <laughs> you're better off without it because it was horrible. Libby is, on its own, a pretty sweet app for reading ebooks. You can also listen to audiobooks downloaded through OverDrive as well. So if your library has access to OverDrive, check that out first, literally, um, because the, you can have fantastic ebooks for almost any platform on that service. And indeed, so far as I know, OverDrive is still only the, the is still currently the only uh, library downloadable content service that supports Kindle. Everyone else gives you an EPUB, and you're kind of you know left to your own devices to get that on your Kindle. But there are more, dear hearts, and there, depending on what you want to read, oh boy. If you're looking for ebooks, see if your library has Overdrive, like I said, but also check for Access 360, Cloud Library, Hoopla, remember Hoopla? Hoopla's back, they've got ebooks, and or Freeding. Are you looking for comics? Sure, you can get yourself a Comixology subscription, but you've got other options there too. There's a service called Comics Plus that's pretty cool. And once again, hey, Hoopla, they offer an excellent selection of downloadable comics from the big names and indie publishers. There are apps for all of these platforms. I mean, if you're using Android, fine. If you're using iOS, fine. If you're using WebOS, what's wrong with you? And so whether or not you're, you're rocking either, you can likely get yourself something for those times when the current situation is no service. Now, all that in mind, what do you do when you're going offline, no signal, and off the grid, but you also need to get some work done? What, did you think I forgot about productivity? Absolutely not. It's simply a big enough topic to deserve its own section of the show. Sometimes the very reason you're going offline is to get things done. That doesn't necessarily mean you're boarding a plane, back when we could board a plane without fear, or heading out into the wilderness, or having yourself a road trip. It could just be that you toggle the airplane mode on your device, and like that, you're offline. Me, I find it incredibly liberating to turn on airplane mode or enable do not disturb so I can really dive into something. Right now, I'm writing this in Scrivener on my MacBook Pro. My MacBook Pro is set to Do Not Disturb, so I don't have any distracting alerts from Twitter or Mastodon or YouTube or whatever else. Likewise, my iPad Pro and iPhone are also currently set to DND, and the only sound I'm getting right now is Drone Zone from Soma FM. I'm not out in the wilds or anything, though, like I said, I live at the edge of a forest. I'm just sitting at the table. Research materials and notes spread out before me, and I'm writing. But except for very specific circumstances, no one can reach me. I'm effectively offline. I do that thing, I do that kind of thing a lot, especially when I'm trying to meet a daily word count, which is something I've been trying really hard to push myself towards. 
but occasionally I will head out on a graycation or a hurly day with instructions to my family that they can call me, but please, only do so if you absolutely need me. Good Lord, I get so much done. So, when I'm hammering away on tasks and I'm disconnected, here's how I'm getting it done. First up, we go back to having an ongoing plan that all the things I need to be productive are set to go at almost any time. Um, just like, you know, if, if you're going to leave the house tomorrow morning and you're going to the coffee shop or whatever and you need your backpack, it would behoove you to have that backpack ready to go, maybe sitting by the door. It's got all the things in it you need. It's got your pens, your papers, your devices. It's got cables and stuff like that. So you don't need to be scurrying around the house, screwing up your headspace with, where's this thing? Where's that thing? I thought it was in the backpack. It's not in the backpack. No, 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 no. You plan for that beforehand, and you do the same thing with your digital tools. So, all this means is that I've organized things to where they're saved locally to my various devices, and I don't have to rely on the cloud to gain access to them. Now, that doesn't mean they're not backed up to the cloud or otherwise living somewhere online. I just mean that the latest versions of whatever it is I need to work on exist on the device that I will use for the task. Likewise, I do most of my drawing and illustrative work on an iPad Pro, mostly in Procreate, so I make sure that the latest versions of whatever it is I'm working on are sitting in Procreate. After all, I can work on whatever I want, knowing that the changes will get synced to the various services I use for backup and cloud storage just as soon as I reconnect to the net at large. So with that laid out, Let's talk about productivity, and let's start with writing, because why not? Writing off the grid is remarkably easy, but it can be such a pain in the ass at the same time. Sure, almost every single word processor out there will work without an internet connection. It's not required to, you know, to type. But sooner or later, I get to a point where I need to look up a thing, or verify a fact, or research a topic. That's as fundamental to my writing process as is typing. So I find that when I'm disconnected, I'll work on something that doesn't require a bunch of research, or I'll plan ahead and bring the research along with me in some format that does work offline. That might be a file folder full of papers, or a bunch of stuff saved to a note-taking app. Uh, more on note-taking apps in a minute. But when it comes to writing, I have three major apps that I turn to. If I'm writing anything smallish, say less than 2,000 words, I'll use Typora on the MacBook Air or IA Writer on the iPad. Both of these apps are markdown editors, and for short form stuff like blog posts or quick articles and essays, Typora and IA Writer are fantastic. Typora is especially nice to use because I love how it renders the markdown in a WYSIWYG manner, where after you complete your markdown markup, the tags, the markup tags will disappear, and your text is rendered as it would be in HTML. Both of, these, uh, both of these apps have a night mode, which keeps me writing for longer because my eyes prefer white text on a black background. Anything bigger than 2,000 words or so, and that's a project for Scrivener. I have tried to find something better than Scrivener, but damn it, I can't. When it comes to big writing projects, Nothing comes close. And since I can use Scrivener on my MacBook and on my iPad and sync the projects through Dropbox, that makes it nothing but an excellent app to get things done. I could do a whole show on Scrivener, and perhaps one day I might. I'm, Scrivener is one of those apps that vexes me, and yet I love it just the same. I mean, there are times where I will go looking for something better than Scrivener, I don't know how many times I've gone looking for something better than Scrivener, but I've never found anything better, at least for me. So, and of course, uh, I use Microsoft Word too, but only as needed. While I have it on my iPad, I can't tell you the last time I ever opened it. Most of the time, if I'm using Word, it's because I have to, or because I'm preparing something for a print publication, and Word documents work well as a basis for uploading projects to Amazon. So... Before I start writing anything extensive, I might need to do some note taking or work out a plan for how the ideas, you know, how the ideas are laying around and how I should turn them into a written thing that's hopefully coherent. 
For that, I have a multifaceted strategy that helps me, uh, gives me some flexibility in organizing my thoughts. My fundamental sort of baseline app for note taking is Apple Notes. I am a big believer in getting things out of your head and writing them down or capturing them digitally because you can have that thought, it's in your head, and it's gone. Apple Notes is kind of like a reporter's notebook. It's small, it's easy to use, it doesn't do a lot, but what it does is it does well. And since it's on my iPhone, and I almost always have my iPhone, it's pretty much a notepad that's always with me. Lists, thoughts, quotes, reminders, URLs, something I want to check out later when I get home, whatever, it just, I, it dumps into notes. And since Apple Notes syncs to my iPad and MacBook, I can pick up the note on either device later on, which is what makes it useful. 90, I would say 90% of the time, if I'm dumping something into notes, I'm probably going to pick it up on my MacBook later. It's something that I want to check out on a larger computer. So Apple Notes is superb for capturing something, but not too great at organizing things. I mean, sure, you can have folders and subfolders and all that, but I need something that tracks multiple projects, ideas, fields, so on. Things I work on a whole bunch of things at the same time. I'm never bored, and I'm always busy, which is how my brain likes it. For ages, I tried making this work in Evernote, and it just... Uh, every time I used Evernote on iOS, it would just piss me off with what it couldn't do. So I finally said, no, this isn't for me. And then I tried OneNote, and then I drank myself into a coma. And then I went back to Evernote. After a while, I tried Notion and once again drank myself into a coma. After I finally woke up in someone else's bed in a small town with a name I couldn't pronounce, I tried looking for something better. I mean, there's nothing bad about Notion, but I always feel like I'm one click away from a SQL database every time I'm using Notion. So thank God I found Joplin. Joplin is a free and open source note-taking app that works damn near everywhere. I've got it on my MacBook, it's on my iPhone, it's on my iPad, it will work in Linux, Windows, and Android too. It's kind of like Evernote. The layout is kind of similar in a lot of ways, but without all the crap. And it works with Markdown. As a matter of fact, Markdown is native. It handles images. You can use your browser plugins to clip and capture web pages. You can have notebooks and notebooks and sub-notebooks, and it's actually rather brilliant. It's a free and open source product, and it's so wonderful. It syncs to anything you care to have it sync to, and that syncing works across platforms. So for me, Joplin isn't just a note-taking app. It's a knowledge and project management system now. I, when I gave it a shot and kind of started getting into it, I just I fell in. I was like, okay, done. This is, this is what I use now. I'm a Joplin guy. So... That's great, but if I need to write down stuff by hand, then GoodNotes is where I'm going first. Now, GoodNotes is an iPad app that is not only 80% 80 of the reason that I own an iPad Pro, it's 50% of the reason that I have an Apple Pencil, the other 50% being Procreate. GoodNotes is exquisite in how it allows you to take notes, maintain multiple digital notebooks, Add information from a wide variety of sources. You can mark up PDFs. You can bring in images. You can copy and paste stuff into it, and so on. And they recently added a night mode with dark paper and white ink, you know, digital ink, I suppose, on dark paper, which is cool enough. But one of the dark paper templates is the Cornell-style note-taking paper, which is a style of handwritten note-taking that is the most pleasing to my brain. So... Yeah, and another great thing about GoodNotes and apps like that is I can carry around 20 notebooks with me, and it doesn't take up any more room than my iPad Pro. So that's that's kind of cool. So while it's not actually a note-taking system, there's an app called MindNote that I use that's definitely an organizational system that helps me get stuff done. If you're unfamiliar, MindNote is a mind mapping app for iPad, iPhone, and Mac OS that's as useful as it is beautiful. And when it comes to bringing together a bunch of ideas, points, apps, concepts, and connecting them into something of a plan, MindNode is excellent. This episode was planned in MindNode because there are so many apps and ideas and thoughts that came to my head that 
just writing this down, you know, making a little list or making a quick outline. No, 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 no. That wasn't working, and that wasn't working fast. So my node was was my man for this one. It was excellent. Um, so this episode was planned in my node, and I'll drop an image of the mind map into the show notes if you're interested. You'll notice the little green checkbox emojis next to different topics. And I added those as I wrote the, the episode, so I could tell easily in a glance, oh, I've talked about that already, and I haven't talked about that thing yet, so I need to, you know, figure out where that goes. That's writing, and while it may sound a lot for just banging some keys and pushing a cursor to the right, you need to realize that I often do some pretty heavy-duty writing. That's not a brag, believe me, it's just something I do. And it's something I do because I enjoy it. I've written five books, I'm working on a sixth. It's not unusual for me to churn out 3,000 words per day. And I use a lot of tools to get that done, to make my life easier, and to, quite frankly, keep me sane. If you're not writing that much, then, yeah, you probably don't need that much. You probably just need a word processor of some kind, and that's fine. And that's cool. If that's what you need and that is what works for you, that's, that's what you need and that's what works for you, and that's perfectly fine. At the very least, now that I've talked about this stuff, maybe you have some more app, you know, some new apps that you might want to try. Now, if I'm not writing words, I'm often writing code. And I've got a couple projects uh, software-wise that I'm working on. And I, uh, when I tell you that I'm a web developer working in PHP with MariaDB backends and along with some Python... You might think that I need some kind of connection to get things done. I mean, PHP requires, you know, website. You need a web server, right? Uh, yes, but I don't need a connection to the Internet. I use two things to work on my little projects. Uh, the first is Visual Studio Code, which is a code editor and kind of sort of not really an integrated development environment. I don't use it like that. Um, but what it is for sure is a lovely place to write code with all the syntax highlighting code management, source control, and all the other bells and whistles that I don't know about and probably don't even care about, because if I don't need it, I don't seek it out. Um, I used Atom for years, and Atom is actually pretty cool. I just prefer VSC just a tiny bit more. And when I'm writing PHP code, yeah, I, I do need a web server running PHP and MariaDB for all of my database needs. And for that, there's AMPS. AMPS, that's A-M-double-P-S, and it's a standalone AMP system that runs on my MacBook Pro. So when I launch it, it fires up Apache Server running PHP and MariaDB. Or maybe it's MySQL. I, I seriously can't remember. They're interchangeable. I, it might be MySQL, but either way, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's just a development environment, and it's great. Once it's up and running, I can install software using the Softaculous system if I want, but I really don't need to do that, I just need a basic AMP server. I can open up Firefox, connect to localhost, and bring up the websites and web apps that I'm working on. If I need to do any database management, PHP MyAdmin is part of the package, and despite its foibles, it's, it's faltered here a bit in the last couple years, it's still my preferred method for interacting with MariaDB and MySQL databases. Yes, I can write SQL on the command line, but that doesn't mean I want to. Moving on from coding to numbers, I occasionally need a spreadsheet app, and for that there's always Excel and numbers. Um, I used LibreOffice for a long time and still do on any Linux machine I happen to be running. But my daily drivers tend to be my MacBook Pro and iPad, and since I work with people who could not care less about open source software, I wind up using Excel quite a bit. Numbers is there when I need something more lightweight. I mean, it's just not as feature-full as Excel is, and, you know, that's fine. That's okay. I wouldn't even really install Numbers if it wasn't already there, and now it takes work to get rid of it, but I do kind of like Numbers a bit. So it's there for the lightweight stuff, for, you know, whenever another Mac user sends me a Numbers file. That does happen occasionally. And when it comes to creativity... I have a lot of options that work well because, so far as I know, none of them require me to be online at all. For video editing, it's Final Cut Pro 10. Audio creation and editing happens in GarageBand and Audacity. Uh, for drawing and illustration, I turn to the Affinity suite of projects. Um, let, me, let me tell you something. If you need a photo editor, a vector editor, and a desktop publishing app, but you do not want to give Adobe a bucket of money... 
for Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign, head on over to Affinity's website and give them a small fraction of what you would pay Adobe for a Creative Cloud subscription, and you'll walk away with Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer, and Affinity Publisher for less than $200 for all three of them. Just boom. Done. And they're freaking awesome. Oh, my God. I, I got in with a Affinity Publisher first because I was working on a desktop publishing project. Like, wow, this is cool. And it would tell you. It's not, it's not preachy. It's not bugging you. But it will tell you, hey, you know, you've got Affinity Publisher. And if, uh, if you were using Affinity Photo, we could make things work between them. You could edit those photos over in Photo and just share them back to Publisher. And it's like, well, okay, it was $25. They were having a sale. Screw it. I will buy Photo. And then I did, and it was glorious. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. If if you do not want to give Adobe any more money, but you need a world class, first class quality uh, photo editor, go get yourself Affinity Photo or anything else from Affinity. They are great. You buy them, you keep them. There is no subscription. Um, I snagged mine on the Mac App Store, and you can get them for iOS too. The iOS ones aren't quite as featureific, but of course not. It's on iOS. Though I have to confess, I don't have them on my iPad at all. I prefer the desktop versions. The kind of stuff I do pretty much requires the desktop versions. But hey, you do you. Though, if I do want to do a bit of drawing, I turn to Procreate on the iPad. As I said before, I make sure that the latest version of whatever I'm working on is sitting on this iPad. So if I'm working on an illustration or something that I'm going to turn into a vector or something later on, yeah, I just make sure it's there for me. And that's, that's not hard. I don't do a lot of journaling, but I do write down my thoughts and concerns occasionally. I wouldn't call it a journal. Nothing starts with Dear Diary. Um, and strangely enough, whenever I do this kind of thing, I prefer to write it by hand. Um, I don't like to type. I actually want the handwriting experience. I think it helps my brain process things a little bit better. Now, I already mentioned Good Notes as the primary reason that I have an iPad Pro and an Apple Pencil, and I just mentioned Procreate as the second major reason. But, you know... Sometimes I like to go analog. And that brings us to the final section of the show. So thanks for hanging on, Cosmonaut. We are almost there. Before we finish up here, there are a few things that I think are worth mentioning. Not only as an offline sort of things, but also things to take into account in any traveling situation. And I bring up travel so often because chances are you've probably gone somewhere to get offline, though nothing stops you from pulling the plug at home. It just may inconvenience others in your house to do so. And besides, it'd be a lot easier to just put your, air, put your devices in airplane mode to begin with. But if you're in an offline situation, maybe you've gone someplace or something like that, there's always the analog solution. Remember, there are plenty of physical versions of the things that I just talked about. You can take real notepads made from dead trees and use them with pencils and pens. You can take notes on these notepads. You can make to-do lists and so on. I typically have a paper notebook and a couple of pens nearby, you know, just in case. They don't weigh much, so I don't even notice them in my bag. Some adults rediscover the joy of coloring, and while there are all kinds of adult coloring book apps on the iPad and iOS and stuff like that that will help you pass the time, you can just get yourself a regular run-of-the-mill coloring book. That, that's fine with real colored pencils or crayons or whatever it is you prefer to use. In the end, you wind up with a cool art piece that's unique to you. You can keep yourself entertained with entire books and magazines filled with crossword puzzles and Sudoku and word searches and so on. And you can buy these at many grocery stores somewhere down their magazine aisles or up near the checkout stands. They're, they're not expensive and they're meant to be sort of disposable. A new traveling buddy that shares space in my bag is the completely awesome Nintendo Switch. I love playing console level games on the go, especially back in the days, you know, I, I might find myself on an airplane for a few hours. Beyond that, there are massive amounts of mobile games out there 
for your smartphones and tablets. Uh, the only thing you do need to watch out for there is some of those games do require an internet connection or they don't work, and those games are wrong. But that, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of the era we live in sometimes. So double check before venturing out into the great wide open. And finally, books and magazines? Yeah, regular old books and magazines, they still work. They they never need charging. They're fairly inexpensive, and they're not as fragile as a Kindle. I mean, you can drop a paperback book on a concrete floor you know, a dozen times, and you'll still be able to read it. You can only drop a Kindle on a concrete floor so many times before you don't have a Kindle anymore. There's this, speaking of books and traveling, there's this, uh, and going offline especially, there's this excellent documentary on Netflix. I really recommend you check it out. It's called Inside Bill's Brain, Decoding Bill Gates. And there are few people in this world who read more than Bill Gates. Not only that, there are people on his staff who keep his classic library-style tote bag. God bless him. This is like, if you think of a library book bag, that's what the man carries. And there are people on his staff that do nothing more, really, than keeping it stocked with new books. And he takes that bag everywhere. He'll walk into a meeting with it, like some people walk into a meeting with a briefcase. There's Bill with Bill's book bag. Um, but for me, the magical part is that Bill disconnects too. And he does these things called Think Weeks, I believe it once a month at the very least, where he flies off to a small isolated cabin and they drop him off with bags of books, notepads, and pens. This cabin contains a desk, a bed, a window, a closet, bathroom, and fridge. The fridge is stocked with Diet Coke and I believe Diet Orange Crush, but mostly Diet Coke. Bill drinks an alarming amount of Diet Coke. Get help, Bill, please. Then he sits down, he opens a book, and he reads. I don't think he's totally disconnected because he has food delivered and I bet there's a phone there in case of an emergency, but he doesn't have his laptop. Uh, no computer. Notes are taken either in the books themselves in the margins or on paper. Uh, small degradation there, but by God, that sounds like my kind of vacation. And it's an excellent example of going offline to accomplish something. I don't know that I could do that for an entire week, but I could definitely make a weekend out of that. So let's roll back to something I just talked about. The chances are there's a phone somewhere uh, likely in that cabin for emergencies. And, you know, people are bringing him food at least a couple times per day or something. Depending on how you're going offline, it's a damn good idea to make sure that you have communications in the event of emergencies. Um, I saw something in a CGP, uh, CGP grave video where he's walking through an airport just after landing in the United States. And he makes a comment about how he's protecting his phone by turning off the biometric access. And then he does something that makes all kinds of sense that I've adopted myself, even though I don't fly internationally. He sets a dead man switch. And if you pause the video, you can see what he's done. And it's simple, but it's effective. He sends a message to someone on Slack, it's blurred out that essentially says, I'm invoking the dead man's detain man switch. If you don't hear from me in two hours, call my lawyer. Now, Gray is making sure he's not locked away someplace for hours and no one knows about it. Because likewise, depending on where you're going and how long you'll be offline, a dead person switch is a damn good idea. Regular check-ins are good, especially if you're alone. And if you can make a phone call, do that at least once a day and coordinate with family or friends to let them know that they should be hearing from you at least once a day, preferably at a certain time. And let them know that if they don't hear from you, that could be the indication of a problem. If you're heading out into the wilderness, be it the actual wilderness or just some new city where no one knows your name, tell others where you're going. They, they don't need to call and bother you. You can gently mention that, that no, you're, you're leaving to go to get some work done. Please don't bother me. They don't need to contact you. Everything is fine so long as you, and everything will be fine so long as y'all set up some rules. I'll call you around five in the evening. If you don't hear from me by six, call me. If I don't answer, then call for help. Something like that. Something simple. Work this out beforehand. And give yourself at least two of these switches. Redundancy does not hurt when your life is on the line. 
Uh, maybe you can call person A, but you forgot to call person B because you got busy after you got off the phone with person A. Maybe before person B freaks out, they call person A and made sure that they've heard from you. Then everything's fine. Everything's cool. Um, you know, these arrangements should be, of course, made with specific people. And do not rely on posting a message to Twitter or Facebook if you're in an emergency. I know there's been some stories like, thanks to a post on Facebook, so-and-so was able to get the help that they needed, you know, in their time of crisis. Yes, but you will literally be trusting your life to the Facebook and Twitter algorithm. And I know for a fact that I never see everything my friends post because Facebook and Twitter don't think it's important enough to show me that kind of thing. So if you do get a signal and you can post to a social network, do yourself a favor and either text a bunch of people instead or use a, you know, Facebook's direct message thing or the, you know, something like that where you are going to ping given people instead of just shouting into the void. Even in these days of quarantine and social distancing, I still feel the need to just go off somewhere and be alone, disconnected, semi-unavailable at the very least. And in a digital world, even one existing within a pandemic and social unrest, this kind of thing is a luxury. Totally is. Absolutely it is. And, you know, I, I feel lucky that I have that luxury. For those that don't, you know, I hope it's something that you get. And I hope that's, you know, something that comes. It's a choice you have, however. Uh, even if you have to set things up in advance, um, you don't have to go someplace. Like I said, you can always just flip the switch and now you're offline. And it's something I strongly recommend, even if you're just working on something that just needs your undivided attention for two hours. You know, two hours, nothing coming in, everything going out. That's great. So tune, you know, turn on, tune out, and shut down the connection, at least for a little while. And we'll see you when you get back, Space Cowboy. that wraps up this episode of cyberpunk librarian thank you so much ladies and gentlemen and genders outside and in between if you stuck with me this long it was a longer show but i hope you got some new tech some new toys some new tips and ideas for getting into that offline situation especially on purpose and uh dealing with it and getting things done and keeping yourself sane it's it's so important right now and, hey, if you stuck with me for an hour and some odd minutes, thanks so much for checking out the show and for sticking with the show. As always, you'll be able to find these show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast, or just take a look at the, uh, the podcatcher app that you're using right now. Chances are it's probably got the show notes in there, too. song you're currently digging on is tears in my heart by psychedelic pedestrian earlier in the show it was a body surfer bonanza ladies and gentlemen because we heard call your grandma wants to know 1717 and jack's tracks all by body surfer you will find links to those in the show notes as well if you want to go check out that music and download it yourself awesome stuff coming from the free music archive who uh they got bought out so there was some downtime there they got a few things broken but now they're fixed and it looks like they're back up in a working capacity so Welcome back, FMA. It's glad to have you back, and thank you so much for providing so much music for my project and other projects like this and projects that aren't anything like this at all. The Internet Archive is the host of Cyberpunk Librarian, and big shout out to them too. The Internet Archive saves, preserves, and distributes all kinds of cool stuff across the Internet and around the Internet, and I gotta thank them for their work, not only just because they, hey, they, you know, they hold on to my podcast for me, but they hold on to all those magazines that I told you about. They've got art books. I mean, they've got so much cool stuff. If you, if you haven't gone spelunking at the Internet Archive, you really need to do so. Classic video games, classic 
videos, documentaries, all kinds of stuff. Go check it out. Archive.org is your destination for when you just feel like you need a little something different. And hey, it's all free. Check it out. Good stuff there. If you want to get in touch with me, well, I highly recommend that you do so. You can always reach out to me on the uh, on the interwebs. I am at Vibrarian on Twitter. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian that it starts with a B. On Mastodon, you will find me on the Glamorous instance. That's G-L-A-M-M-R dot U-S, where I am at Cyberpunk Librarian at Glamorous. So, hey, you can reach out to me there. I've been rocking Mastodon for quite a while now, and boy, oh boy, I do prefer it over almost any other social network that I've been on in a long time. And if you prefer the old SMTP method, well, it's tried and true, and it still works with everything. You can always reach out to me at Cyberpunk Librarian at ProtonMail. Dot com. The opening track to this episode, as always, is Billy Dance of the Bisu by Rio Miashita. You'll also find links in the show notes for that. And, hey, it's about time to get out of here. So thank you so much for tuning in. Hope to see you on the next episode. Already in progress. I'm already working on it. Hopefully it doesn't take as long as this one, because this one was a real corker, but I had a great time. Thanks so much to uh, for that question on Mastodon. So I'm going to get out of here. I wish you well. I wish you peace. I wish you power. And I wish you everything that you want in a tumultuous world. My name is Daniel Messer. I'm the cyberpunk librarian reminding you that you don't have to be high tech to be low budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care, beloved.